the financial centers of the world, this is Bloomberg Markets with Alex Steele and Guy Johnson. We're 30 minutes into U.S. trading. It is Thursday, the 7th, the 23rd. What do you need to know? What are you following at this hour? Let me tell you, stocks heading into the holidays with a huge tailwind. Basically, optimism is growing that Omicron, the Omicron wave might be breaking soon. We've got vaccine good news. We've got antiviral good news. Travel stocks continuing to outperform. We could be heading for a fresh, fresh record uh, close amazing to think about that happening considering how we started the week. U.S. consumer spending starting to stall. Inflation definitely biting. You, Mitch, confidence data about to hit the Bloomberg terminal. I'll bring you that data in just a moment. Plus, the 2022 food fight. We're going to dig into why U.S. farmers might be planting different crops next year as fertilizer costs surge. What is that going to mean for A, meal planning, and B, inflation. From London, I'm Guy Johnson. My co-host today in New York, Shanali Basak. Alex Steele has a well-deserved day off as she prepares for the holidays. Welcome, everybody, to Bloomberg Markets. Shanali, as I say, it's an amazing story. What a turnaround for a Monday. Today just feels like a good news day. Yeah, it's a good news day. You have markets scraping at every bit of good news. Because remember, in the consumer confidence data yesterday, consumers are still worried about inflation. But with spending just in line with expectations, with jobless claims just in line with expectations. That Merck authorization for emergency use is just the good news we need to get into the green on a holiday day. Absolutely. We are seeing light volume, so it's not that hard a push, but Santa does seem to be in charge, finally, <laughs> of this week. Shanali, let's just deal with the data. We're getting more of it now. It's a bit of a data dump uh, as we head into the holidays. So let's work our way through the numbers and what they tell us about the economy right now. Let's start off with the University of Michigan. The headline number in the Consumer Sentiment Survey, 70.6. Now, that is pretty much in line with expectation, 70.4, the expectation. That was the number last time round. Uh, in terms of current conditions, 74.2. That's, again, just a little bit of a dip from the 74.6 last time round. Expectations, though, actually pick up, which I think is interesting. 68.3 versus 67.8. Now let's get on to the real meat of this story. Where is one-year inflation going? Where is inflation going further forward from that? So the headline number here, one-year inflation, 4.8%. Now that's down from 4.9%, but it's still an elevated number. Consumer confidence around inflation, I think, is being eroded. You've seen that in the spending data today. You're seeing that in these numbers as well. New home sales coming through strong as well. We do seem to be seeing something of a rebound uh, in the housing market right now. Let's turn our attention to the question of the day, and that is, can central banks tame this kind of inflation without causing a recession? Certainly financial markets aren't anywhere near pricing a recession, but you start to look under the hood a little bit uh, in terms of some of the other data, maybe that's what we're starting to see. Yelena Shulyatyeva is back at Bloomberg. Bloomberg Economics Senior US Economist and Vince Signorella joining us from our M Live team. Yelena, let me start with you. The Fed is saying it's going to hike three times next year. I'm hearing a lot of economists saying potentially it may need to go four. History would say that when the Fed starts tightening, a recession isn't too far behind. What do you think? Well, uh, I would just say that it's all in the hands of the consumers. It will be very important to see what consumers do in this environment when Omicron and consumers' resilience to Omicron, as well as consumers' resilience to inflation, uh, what that does to uh, GDP growth. So I think uh, the Fed is very serious about inflation. They are going to uh, tighten policy, and they can uh, absolutely tame inflation. Uh, no question about that. I think what's really important is what happens to uh, growth, and uh, this is uh, kind of not in the Fed's hands. I think what is really important to see if, uh, you know, uh, uh, Omicron is really going to uh, push growth lower. So, but the Fed is very serious about tightening, no, no question about that. You know, it's interesting. We normally look at the 210 yield curve here. And Vince, I'm wondering, the 530 was flattening far before the 210 was. And I'm wondering if bond traders should look farther out on the horizon here to look at the flattening in terms of what it's signaling for a future recession. Yeah, and I, I think uh, that's a really good 
uh, point because you have to understand the Fed is tapering in the belly of the curve. So that's in that five, seven year uh, more or less space. So as that bond purchases come off, there's more likely than not, you're going to see some flattening between the 530s. Now, typically, people would say that's potentially recessionary as curves flatten because they, they see somewhat of a potential for an inversion. I don't think that's going to happen. I think the yield curves are going to ratchet up altogether. Uh, but you certainly do risk some more flattening uh, because of that space. And I, I think earlier, Yelena's comment about the U.S. consumer um, is, is bang on. I mean, we're seeing um, uh, real earnings um, decline because of inflation increases that erodes disposable income. And we see uh, spending dropping today. Potentially, we've pulled first quarter growth into this quarter with consumers fearing higher prices for next, for next year. Yelena, do you believe, how much trust you put in market pricing around inflation? So I think uh, what we need to see is what happens uh, with the yield curve. And uh, that goes back to your question uh, about the Fed. So the Fed will start uh, tightening. They will raise uh, rates. But uh, we will need to see, and this goes to uh, uh, what um, Vince was saying, whether the yield curve uh, is going to invert. If we see signs of that, the Fed will probably step, step back from that. And I think that's what is the real story to watch in 2022. To that end, Vince, how much faith do you have in the Fed controlling inflation? Uh, to be honest, I would say zero. Uh, historically, and, and if you go uh, after you leave the Volcker era of the 80s, historically, Federal Reserve chairs and the Federal Reserve as a whole um, have missed forecasts and missed badly. We saw periods a few years ago where they thought we were uh, heading into an inflationary period and they raised rates four times in a row by 25 basis points, only to a short time later take them down completely by that whole four basis uh, four interest rate increase. I think the Fed is is on the right track to raise, but the idea that they can actually get a grasp on inflation, get a grasp on what's going on to be able to control inflation is extremely difficult. And I think the market has way too much confidence in their ability to get that done perfectly. Vince, um, Larry Summers is talking about a recession followed by stagflation. How would you handicap that? I say stagflation is quite real, to be honest. Um, when, when you see rising inflation, and uh, we saw a slight downturn in numbers today, but still, as you mentioned, at very high levels. When you see rising inflation and you don't see increases in wages, you, you see an erosion of spending power on the consumer. That, that erosion of spending power means a slower economy because you're going to have lower earnings. If inflation doesn't come back down because the economy slows, and this is a supply side driven inflation, so that may not happen. If it doesn't come down and wages don't go up to meet that inflation uh, increase, then we definitely have a real possibility of stagnant inflation. You know, I'm curious, Yelena, what is the risk here that inflation does not start to subside in the next couple of quarters and the role that energy prices have to play in that? Well, the risks, uh, again, and I keep uh, returning to that, are uh, on the virus, because as Vincent mentioned, uh, this is a very much supply-driven uh, uh, sort of inflation. So if uh, another disruption emerges in terms of supply chains, we can see uh, another uh, spike in inflation. But uh, also, let me just push back on what Vincent said earlier. In today's numbers for November personal income, we saw a significant increase in wages. Uh, that is building on another increase in the months of October. So we do see healing in the labor market. Uh, and uh, we see that uh, materializing in Yelena? growth. Yelena, do you think those wages, though, are going to keep up with inflation? Because that, I guess, is the point that Vince is trying to get at, that, that, if, that if wages don't do that then that is ultimately going to put a crimp on, on the ability of the consumer to get through this. Absolutely. This is a, uh, this is a very good point. But I think uh, we will continue to see wages growing. And at the same time, consumers are getting some help from savings. Remember, savings glut uh, that was built over the crisis, it's still there. You know, consumers are dipping into savings. They're enjoying higher wages. And I think inflation will recede going into the next year. It's just, uh, you know, we will see that bumpy road uh, with uh, further disruption 
uh, creating risks around high inflation. But I think uh, we are on the right track and uh, mm -hmm. wages will uh, eventually uh, make a bigger contribution than um, what we see in terms of inflation. A bumpy road's not always bad. It can be very good for traders. Vince, what is the best year-end trade that you've got? I, I would say it's the, the, the trade that has held true for the last five years, and everyone seems to try to fight it, is that there, to me there are two scenarios that play out. One is um, the, the variant is worse than we think and sticks around longer, and the dollar becomes a haven trade. The other is that that seems to go away. Economies really explode to the upside. Uh, U.S. rates have to be raised more aggressively, and that, too, would lift the dollar. So I'm a long dollar fan for 2022. All right. That's Bloomberg's Yelena Shilatieva and Vince Signorella. Thank you both for your time. Coming up, we'll continue asking our question of the day, and it's whether central banks can tame inflation without causing a recession. Jordan Jackson, J.P. Morgan Asset Management, global market strategist, joins us next. This is Bloomberg. Check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Rishka Gupta. Merck's COVID-19 pill is cleared by U.S. regulators, giving high-risk patients another at-home treatment option. The drug received emergency authorization on the heels of Pfizer's competing pill that was cleared yesterday. Together, the treatments promise to provide a new way to keep a sharp rise in infections from overwhelming U.S. hospitals. Russian President Vladimir Putin is urging the West to move quickly to meet Russia's demand for security guarantees to defuse a standoff over Ukraine. Speaking during his annual news conference today, Putin warned that Moscow expects next month's talks with the US in Geneva to produce some quick results. It's not us threatening them. We didn't come to the border of the United States or the United Kingdom. No, they came to our house, to our border. And now they're saying, ah, we want Ukraine to be part of us as well. And you want guarantees from us? No, you are owing us guarantees now, without any delay. Not in decades. Putin made no mention of the threat of military action as he did earlier this week, but said the Kremlin will do what it needs to ensure Russia's security. Former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers is warning of a testing period for the U.S. economy in coming years with the risk of recession followed by stagnation. In an interview with Bloomberg's Economics Stephanomics podcast, Summers says the Fed has been late to spot the dangers of inflation and that delayed action to cool prices could potentially tip the economy into a slump. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rishka Gupta. This is Bloomberg Shanali. Yeah, thank you so much, Ritika. And let's get back to the question that's underpinning this market, and that's whether central banks can tame inflation without causing a recession. To help us answer that question, we have Jordan Jackson. He's J.P. Morgan Asset Management, global market strategist. Jordan, thank you so much for joining us. What is the risk here of a recession? I think the risk is, is very low. Uh, the reality is demand for labor continues to be very, very strong. The inflationary pressures that we're seeing are primarily supply-side driven inflation. And if the Fed can be effective in sort of taming that, I think I think we all recognize that monetary policy may be may be a blunt tool, right? But you know, given that supply-side inflation, they probably can't really control uh, you know, supply chains being backlogged, produce manufacturers not being able to get goods uh, on time, but they can raise interest rates and, and sort of uh, uh, ward off demand. They, they can raise interest rates, particularly when we look at some of the more stickier parts of inflation, things like shelter prices, owners, uh, owners equivalent rent. Uh, for example, if the Fed raises rates, this directly impacts the affordability in the housing market. And I think that could sort of slow some of the, uh, some of the more stickier parts, like that shelter inflation piece uh, that tends to get talked about a lot in overall demand uh, for goods and services throughout the economy as well. So, you know, uh, monetary policy may be a blunt tool, but it is somewhat effective 
uh, in warding off, I think, some of the inflationary pressures that we see bubbling up uh, uh, as we look forward to 2022. Jordan, so where does that leave us in terms of the cycle? I'm hearing a lot of people increasingly talking about the fact that we are late cycle. And if we're late cycle, we need to start adapting the way that we're investing right now, particularly in equities. Well, I think real rates continue to be very materially negative. Um, and we typically late cycle, we start to see real rates start to move at least towards zero and potentially into positive territory. And so, you know, I think it's it's a little bit premature to say that we are, to say that we're late cycle. I think what we can say though, as we think about positioning is that the easy money has been made. Uh, this is an active, uh, an active market in which you want to be doing a more bottoms up approach in, in, in stock picking. Uh, and so I think, again, the easy money has been made. And so as we move to a period in which uh, the Fed is tightening, uh, there's a big question mark on how much fiscal stimulus is going to come through, if, if Build Back Better makes its way uh, through. Uh, and so I think this is just in turn, you, you want to be have a bottoms up approach, an active approach uh, to the market today. You mentioned the cooling of shelter inflation. Barring a recession, which asset prices are you most worried about in the next six months? You know, I, I still want to see how uh, auto prices develop, how energy prices develop. And this is uh, an energy more so having an impact on the headline numbers. Uh, but we want to see if, if right, used autos up, you know, north of 20 percent year to date. Uh, it's unlikely for that to, to persist. Uh, I think energy prices is also another question mark. You know, we look at oil inventories across the globe. Uh, they still remain relatively low uh, relative to history. So that could still provide some support uh, for, for, uh, for energy prices. Uh, of course, all, uh, 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 jet fuel demand is going to be pretty important. And so as, as industrial or airline travel potentially takes a little bit of a breather as a result of Omicron, that could potentially keep oil prices and energy prices overall uh, a bit elevated. So those are the two, some of the more, if you will, quote unquote, transitory pieces of the inflation aspect that I'm going to be continuing to watching in, in, in the hopes uh, that they'll start to start to cool in the, in the quarters ahead. Jordan, do you think we're going to see significant volatility next year? Um, and if so, do I want to be fully invested or do I want to think about having dry powder to take advantage of some of those some of those dips? Well, I think you absolutely want to be fully invested. I mean, there's, the reality is uh, that's the reason why we diversify our portfolio, right? Because we can't really tell what sort of black swan event uh, is, is going to happen. And for those investors who have sort of been sitting on the sidelines all through the, the third and, and fourth quarter uh, waiting for a pullback, you've continued to see the market sort of continue to, to, to grind higher. And so you don't want to be sort of left on the sidelines. I think how you play it is you try to mitigate your downside. Uh, you use sort of hedge products, you know, uh, you know, derivative options to sort of help mitigate some of the downside risk within portfolios. But I think you certainly want to be fully invested, particularly when cash is giving you a negative real return. When you look at the market right now, are you still worried that people are taking on a little bit too much leverage, given where we are in the cycle? Uh, not too concerned about uh, the leverage picture. You know, I, I think when I when I look at the markets uh, uh, more broadly, you know, we're currently in a period where liquidity is sort of a bit shallow as you're running through the, the holiday season, so to speak. I think as we move through the fundamental picture, as we look towards to, to next year, earnings growth is still expected to be uh, relatively uh, uh, robust. I do expect buyback activity to pick up uh, as well as we move over the course of, of next year. And again, I think a resilient consumer is going to provide a lot of support for, for uh, the fundamentals of, of the market more broadly. And so I think, you know, even though while, you know, a lot of talk about moving late cycle and investors should try, try to be deleveraging, I'm still I'm still of the opinion that uh, uh, I'm a little bit more optimistic than I am pessimistic about market returns next year. Jordan, it's been great to catch up with you this year. It's been great for you to join us on this show. We always appreciate your time. Thank you so much for some of it today. Have a very happy holiday. Jordan Jackson of JP Morgan Asset Management. Thank you very much indeed. Still ahead, cruising along. The cruise sector advancing once again this morning. It's had a whipsaw week, though. COVID worries at the beginning, much more positive as we come through the end. We'll deal with the details when we come back. This is Bloomberg.
The reopening trade is still on. Travel and leisure stocks leading gains in both the U.S. and Europe this morning on positive virus data. Bloomberg's Ritika Gupta is here with more. Ritika. Yeah, Shanali, it turns out that travel stocks have really turned out to be some of your big winners on the week. Quite a reversal to what we saw at the start of the week with those fears of the Omicron variant. But now they seem to really have shrugged those off, this idea that the Omicron variant may be less deadly than that of the Delta variant. So let's take a look at some of the big gains that we're seeing on the week for some of your cruise lines. Carnival up some 20%, uh, Norwegian cruise lines up some 16%. But still, nonetheless, it's been a challenging environment. It's been a a challenging year for them as uh, they've had to navigate those restrictions and some of the ways that they've been able to navigate through that is actually by racking up a lot of debt and you can see that here with our three uh, key cruise line operators here 2021 debt levels in your double digits for carnival for instance the 2021 debt levels more than three times what we saw the long-term debt levels in 2019 uh, pre-pandemic but let's focus on the here and the now focus on this week what we've seen on the broader uh, travel sector here you can see airlines up some 8.5 percent or so this is uh, really, as we saw the passenger levels last week for airlines actually approaching those 2019 levels. We're also seeing for casinos getting some strong gains here. We actually had see that big uh, CES uh, convention. That is going to be live and not virtual. So that's something to be optimistic about. And then, of course, taking a look at Europe, we're also seeing travel and leisure getting a boost Big boost there on the week, despite the fact, Guy, that we did get that uh, profit warning from Ryanair just earlier today. Yeah, the travel industry's had a really bumpy ride this year. Ryanair's balance sheet is probably one of the best that's out there. Nevertheless, this is an industry that has created huge amounts of debt as we've gone through this process. Losses have been absolutely massive. Is there any optimism based around kind of what we're seeing in terms of share prices that that may start to turn around now? Yeah, well, Guy, if we just focus on some of those losses that you've been talking about, because if you look within the S&P 500, the 10 biggest uh, losers on a 12-month trailing basis, travel actually accounts for more than half of those, Guy. Uh, so that is something to keep in mind. Carnival, the losses, more than $9.5 billion net loss. Uh, and that, what's more, 2022, it's a, a year of two halves, really. They see uh, next year being uh, perhaps getting a profitability, Guy, but for now... Some losses ahead. Summer season going to be absolutely pivotal in all of this. The winter's usually quiet. Looks like it's going to be tough. Summer, absolutely pivotal. Uh, up next, we're going to talk about the energy crisis here hitting Europe. Uh, we are down today in terms of gas prices. Francisco Blanche, Bank of America, global head of commodities and derivatives, joining us next. This is Bloomberg. We're an hour into U.S. trading. Are we on track for another fresh record high? Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle is here with the details. Oh, well, Guy, you know, it's what a difference three days makes. Because earlier this week, the sky was falling on Omicron, fears that it was really going to dent the global growth picture. And here we are, three updates. And to your point, we are heading to another all-time high. The S&P 500 at this point up 3.4%. Really an impressive turnaround, and very similar to what we've been seeing uh, in recent months, where we have a period of risk off, risk on, risk off, and right now, clearly risk on. Now, a big piece of this, of course, is the reflation trade. Banks are sharply higher. This, of course, as yields are higher. What makes it so interesting, though, the 10-year yield really in the sweet spot, you could make the case uh, for the Fed. Not too high, not too low, right around 150. But you can see banks are higher off their highs earlier, up more than 1%, but nonetheless a nice lift. We also have yep. a nice lift for the travel trade. If we take a look at what's happening over the last five days, you can see that the hotel index, the airline index, along with wind resorts and Las Vegas sands are higher. Of course, as Ritika was pointing out not so long ago, big declines uh, more recently, so a bit of a catch-up trade here, but nonetheless very impressive uh, with the airline index, the hotel index actually up more than 12 percent over the last five days. And finally, rounding it out, we have energy higher, too, or at least the last time I looked. We do have lots of shifts happening quickly, but we do still have ExxonMobil and Chevron higher, and, of course, gasoline higher, up 7 tenths of 1 percent, at one point up 3 percent. Of course, ExxonMobil has that uh, refinery fire um, down in Texas that has brought the price of gasoline higher. So lots of green on the screen, including Energy Guy.
Abigail, thank you very much indeed. Let's talk about the natural gas market. Gas prices are absolutely plunging today, down really sharply, as you can see. Uh, really big moves. We've just had some data as well, some inventory data, bang in line with estimates, uh, down by 55 BCF. That's what the inventory uh, data is telling us. Um, that is a significant divergence from what we've seen recently. Milder weather, certainly a factor going forward from here. We've also got a change in the narrative in Europe. So European nat gas has come down sharply as well today. And one of the reasons for this, and I hope you can see this on the screen, it's a fantastic function on the Bloomberg, uh, is you've got all these LNG carriers that are heading out of the United States towards Europe. European prices are super high right now, and as a result of which these cargoes are moving across the Atlantic uh, as we struggle here in Europe uh, to, to deal with cold weather that is certainly here at the moment, uh, the absence of Russian gas, which Vladimir Putin was talking about uh, earlier on today. Is this just going to be a blip, though, this move that we're seeing down today? Uh, are we going to see maybe prices resuming their upward trajectory, uh, which have been so steep so far this year? At the moment, looks like help is uh, on the way, certainly from the United States. We just need more liquefaction plants over in the U.S. to help us out. Let's talk about this. Francisco Blanche, Bank of America, global head uh, of global commodities and derivatives research. Francisco, thank you for taking some time on Christmas Eve Eve to talk to us. What do you make of the moving gas today? It is a big move to the downside. Is this a blip or the start of a sustainable trend? Well, look, uh, there's, uh, there's one thing in commodities uh, that goes along the way of uh, high prices. Uh, the cure for high prices is uh, high prices. So when prices do spike like this, you get reactions. You mention yourself, uh, there is uh, LNG cargoes going into Europe, uh, you're probably also going to get some demand destruction in the process. Um, a lot of the European um, industrial players I've spoken to for the last few months have been trying to curtail their natural gas consumption pretty aggressively because of this prices. Uh, nothing really makes sense um, and, and puts them at a competitive disadvantage. Uh, but Europe still needs to get through the winter. So um, it's still a concern. Uh, we have pretty low inventories, and um, and when inventories are, are at these low levels, uh, you get these extreme price moves, and uh, and and hopefully this this last jump in prices uh, will cure the uh, will cure the, 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 the challenges that Europe has faced and and move us into a more stable price environment into into the first quarter. But but Europe's not out of the woods yet uh, by by any means. So. Open up your crystal ball here and start to draw out what the situation will look like over the next month or two. So I think, I think for the next month uh, or two, we're still going to experience extremely high volatility in, uh, in natural gas prices, global natural gas prices. Uh, the U.S. is different, though. In the U.S., we are, we are getting a supply response, uh, mainly from, uh, from producers in the Hainesville and other parts of the country. Um, we've seen a 2 BCF a day increase in production between November and October. Uh, we are also likely expecting to see more production coming through in December. So the U.S. Uh, shale industry is responding to the higher prices in the U.S. But again, uh, Europe doesn't have that lever. Uh, needs to experience yep. a very high price so that the LNG cargoes make it over there. So that's, that's where we are. So I think high volatility is going to be the name of the game for gas. Um, but then going into the summer, I still see very high prices in Europe because, um, again, we've disinvested a lot in domestic production across the European region and become too reliant on, on LNG and Russia. Uh, that's, that's the other part of the story. So, Francisco, what does next winter look like? And the reason I ask about this is there is this kind of expectation that, that inflation is going to fall as we work our way through next year. But if we see a repeat performance of what we're seeing here in Europe this year, next year, maybe we need to call that into question. We also need to call into question the growth impulse that we're going to see in Europe next year. As you say, industrials are having to maybe change their thinking around their energy consumption. Right. You know, we, we do believe that, uh, that Europe is pretty much in an industrial recession right now uh, with this kind of prices. You're looking at $250 a barrel of oil equivalent. Uh, in terms of the uh, cost per MMBTU of gas uh, in, in the region. So it's really unaffordable. Um, we're looking at potentially uh, energy consumption being two or three percentage points higher as a share of income in Europe than it was back at the, at the heights of the European sovereign debt crisis. Um, and also when oil was back at $147 a barrel. So again, it's all driven by gas and power. So, so Europe is in a tough spot. I think European politicians are starting to realize that this ca cannot go on. Uh, remember, it's not just gas, it's also carbon emission prices. They've hit record levels. 
Um, and that's a tax that power generators have to pay. It's a tax that uh, many industries in Europe have to pay as well. So, um, so I think I think we are we are running before we can walk when it comes to the energy transition, um, and and we've disinvested from hydrocarbons a little too fast here, um, and and maybe that's why we are we are now experiencing this this incredible volatility. Our, our fear is that some of this um, pressure we're seeing on gas start to feed all the way into oil. That, in my mind, would be. Uh, the danger scenario for, for 2022, and you mentioned Omicron now looks like less of a risk. Uh, if that is the case, and we all start traveling again in 2022, as we did pre, pre uh, COVID, we're going to have a bottleneck. We are not going to have probably enough oil to make all that happen. So, so there's a risk oil uh, spikes next year if Omicron just hits us fast and furious and, and, and we, we uh, um, go back uh, in, in, you know, February, March to, to, to the travel patterns so pre-pandemic. So that's what I'm worried about. Really. It's a fascinating projection on oil, and I'm wondering how high you actually think it can go and what that means for all the inflation watchers out there. Um, that's, that's a great question. So we, we have $85 a barrel on Brent uh, as a forecast uh, for next year, and uh, uh, $82 a barrel on WTI. Uh, this is our average forecast for the year. Again, compare that to our more bearish outlook on the U.S. natural gas market, where we see supply responding quickly uh, to, the, to the higher prices. But, but importantly, uh, the key thing here, and we suspended our target, we had a target of $120 a barrel by the summer of next year. We suspended in, in the early stages of the Omicron uh, development because we didn't really quite know how big a factor Omicron was going to be. But if the news are indeed confirmed that Omicron is going to be, as I said before, fast and furious, uh, not going to be as dangerous, that could end up being quite bullish for oil next year uh, as, yep. as the world gets back on track and everyone gets back to travel. So, so that's the one thing that we're really watching carefully. We're, we're going to have an oil problem next year. And, and for inflation watchers, well, Friends. Uh, that's challenging. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, no kidding. Um, Francisco, listed shale producers in the United States, very disciplined this year, very disciplined next year. This strikes me as being the kind of the swing factor in 2022. I'm not sure how much spare capacity that OPEC really has. U.S. shale's got a lot of spare capacity. It's just got to decide to use it. Um, I mean, yes, yes and no. Uh, I mean, I think, first of all, if you look at, at the uh, returns uh, that the industry has delivered in the last five years, I think the, the return on capital employed uh, has been zero. Uh, the return on capital employed for the last 10 years has been 5%. And there is a reason why energy uh, has been the worst performing sector of the S&P in the last six or seven years, right? Uh, and even if you go back in time, you're also going to find energy has been the worst performing sector. Investors are tired of, of CEOs and, and, uh, and management teams in the energy names just, just dropping money into the ground. They want them to produce returns. So the past history is a drag on returns. The bigger challenge is the future. Uh, and, and, and the future here entails the energy transition. Um, do we want to have a future without oil? And if we do, then why should companies invest right now? Because there is maybe a shortage of, of oil for a few months before we all move to electric vehicles. This is where the energy transition is creating frictions. And as, as uh, you know, when you have the past and the future being hurdles to investment, uh, things can get quite quite volatile in the energy space uh, across the board, not just in gas. Because remember, I mentioned low inventories in gas, but inventories in oil are also very low. And we've been drawing at a rate of 10 plus million barrels a week uh, forever. Uh, inventories have come down in a straight line around the world, uh, partly managed by OPEC, uh, but uh, but now we're getting to a point where, where Russia maybe has three more months of spare capacity, where Saudi Arabia, yes, they have an extra million barrels a day, but things are starting to get a little tight. So we may have to call on shale. And, um, you know, I think we, we heard uh, Scott Sheffield, the CEO of Pioneer, uh, saying that he hasn't had the call from from uh, the uh, from from the U.S. government yet. <laughs> so so we'll see if that comes through. Yeah. And uh, obviously with the Christmas season, forgive me for the jokes. Uh, plenty of coal going around this year, I'm sure. Um, with the energy transition, Francisco, I'm wondering what you think will be the best uh, bet for investors into next year. Right. So I think if, if indeed uh, the, the news we're hearing on Omicron uh, do get confirmed that we are starting to get towards the, the, the end of this pandemic, um, again, as we, I think we're all hoping um, that this is the case because we're all tired of doing this uh, remotely for, for so long. But 
Um, I think the 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 um, the concern I have here is is that we have a tight uh, situation in oil markets next year, um, and and the prices do spike. But remember, one thing that could happen uh, that may delay the upsurge in energy prices, and we we like oil as a as a as a, as a bull market. We like copper. Uh, we like uh, the industrial metals generally um, as as enablers of the energy transition. And the one thing I'm worried about is China, because China doesn't have any natural immunity to Omicron uh, or to coronaviruses generally, uh, and, and to to, uh, to COVID-19. And China also uh, has uh, vaccinated people with non-mRNA uh, vaccines, and 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 the vaccine escape is higher in that case. So, so it could be the case that China, with its zero COVID tolerance uh, situation, uh, might have struggled to to manage 2022 from from a transportation standpoint. Remember, China is the number two uh, consumer of oil in the world and is the number one oil importer by a long shot. So, so that's the one thing I'm, I'm a little concerned that we might not see the bull market in oil that that, uh, that that we have in the cards here. So that's that's what I'm watching carefully right now to, to confirm our bull trend in oil. And as I said, I think the metals uh, will continue to perform well as they relate to the energy transition. Uh, aluminum, nickel, uh, copper, uh, I would be buyers of, of those metals selectively on this. Positions us really well into the next year. We'll be watching your research closely. That's Francisco Blanche of Bank of America Global Research. Thank you for your time. Coming up, we have Kevin McNew, the Farmers Business Network Chief Economist, joining us on his insight on where inflated food prices go next. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Markets. I'm Rishki Gupta, and you're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up, Lara Rain, the FS Investments Chief US Economist. It's 12 p.m. in New York, 5 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Let's check in on the Bloomberg First Word News. I'm Rishka Gupta. The European Union is urging negotiators to speed up their efforts to resolve a standoff between Iran and the U.S. when they meet on December the 27th for the next round of talks aimed at reviving the 2015 nuclear deal. The EU's chief negotiator tweeted today that it's important to, quote, pick up the pace on key outstanding issues. The U.S. exited the pact in 2018 and reimposed sanctions on Iran, which in response started to significantly expand its nuclear program. Orders placed with U.S. factories for durable goods rose in November by the most in six months. That beats forecasts and points to steady demand that will help drive production growth in early 2022. Bookings for all durable goods or items meant to last at least three years increased 2.5 percent from the prior month, partly reflecting a sharp rise in commercial aircraft orders. Global News 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Rich Gupta. This is Bloomberg Channel. Yeah, thank you, Ritzika. We have food inflation now that's also rising significantly. The cost of almost every input here has risen much higher since 2019. Listen, Guy, in our lifetimes, in the last decade, we have seen higher prices of sugar. We have seen higher dairy prices before. It's really these oils here that have jumped way beyond anything else, followed by cereals as well. But these oil prices, you cannot make cookies with vegetable oil. So we're here to talk more about this now and where it goes from here is Kevin McNew, Farmers Business Network Chief Economist. Kevin, I'm really curious here as to at what point some of these food prices start to calm down. You know, I think as we look forward into 22, I don't think there's any relief in sight for consumers at the grocery store. You know, as you mentioned, you know, across the board, we're seeing higher prices. Last year, it was more of a story of supply chain disruptions, more of a story around uh, constraints in the ag processing sector, like meat supply chain uh, situations. But now, as we enter 22, it's really starting at the farm level. We see higher fertilizer prices that are up three times from what they were last year, really driven by kind of energy problems. We see farm chemical prices, a lot of the inputs that farmers are buying 
up four to five times from last year. Again, uh, you know, constraining constraining production. And so, you know, as we look ahead into 22, I, I think consumers are going to expect to see more and more price inflation coming on their food tick out. In terms of what farmers can do about this, Kevin, um, I, deer are selling a lot of new kits at the moment that is much more efficient. Um, we're seeing farmers shifting the type of planting they're doing. In, in terms of what can manage this process for the farmers, what are the best things that they can do? What do you expect them to do? You know, at FBN, we've been talking to our farmers quite aggressively about, you know, really locking in uh, their input needs for the coming growing season. I know prices are exceptionally high right now, but we don't expect them to back down and we don't expect availability uh, to really improve in the coming six months as farmers enter the planting season. So you know, we've been telling farmers to get really aggressive around their, their locking in. Uh, and we saw, you know, as we talked to farmers this fall, you know, a lot of them are kind of sitting on their hands around fertilizer and fertilizer is so vitally important for corn production. And so while they got some fertilizer applied this fall, they're going to need more heading into the spring and they're kind of sitting on their hands to see if the back down in natural gas prices will improve the fertilizer market. Uh, but it's a little bit like Russian roulette. So we'll see what happens in three to four months when they get to the field. You know, it's interesting. I'm wondering, some people call these supply chain issues, but when you think of fertilizer, you also start to worry about global trade. How much is the trade network a uh, concern when it comes to what's coming in from China and other nations? You know, that's a good question. I mean, China and Russia both are major fertilizer suppliers to the world. And as we saw this kind of fertilizer crisis looming in the last three or four months, both of those countries put on on the amount of fertilizer they were going to export to the world market, trying to be a little protective for their own domestic situation. So, you know, we'll see as we get into, uh, you know, natural gas prices have backed down some. Uh, maybe some of these issues get worked through. Uh, but I, again, as we are, are looking at a three to four month clock for farmers to need fertilizer, I'm not sure there's enough time to really change the paradigm of really, you know, record high fertilizer yep. prices. Kevin, what do you see in the protein markets? Um, obviously, feedstock is critical. That we've already talked about in, in some respects. It's going to be more expensive uh, as it works its way through from field uh, to, to animal. Uh, in terms of what we're seeing elsewhere as well, you've got uh, avarian flu remaining a significant factor as well. I'm just kind of wondering where you see the protein market going. That looks like it's even almost more challenged uh, than some of the arable crops. Yeah, I mean, a great point, Guy. I mean, like I said, last year, the protein and, and what consumers were seeing at, uh, say, the, the, beef, uh, the beef aisle uh, was really around supply constraints. You know, beef packers really couldn't get the labor they needed. They were really constrained in that sense. But now, as we enter 22, it's really kind of at the farm level, at those livestock producer levels. We saw major droughts in kind of the northwest part of North America that kind of forced some liquidations of livestock herds. We see livestock numbers coming down as a result of that. We also see livestock numbers kind of constrained because of rising feed costs. So I think 22 is going to be a story where it's really starting at the farm gate level with higher uh, feed prices transferring into uh, livestock, meat and poultry mm -hmm. uh, and, and dairy uh, that's going to kind of hit the consumers in 22. So I'm not sure we'll see the big, big gains we saw in 22 like we saw in 21, but I don't think there's any relief in sight. And so I think, you know, price increases at the food level will, will be there. Kevin, we're going to wrap it up. Thank you very much indeed for your time today. Really appreciate it. Have a very Merry Christmas. Kevin McNew, Farmers Business Network, Chief Economist. Looks like it's going to be an interesting year ahead. That inflation narrative just about everywhere you look at the moment, isn't it? This is Bloomberg. Right, we're about to start counting down to the European close. Let me give you some data, update you on where we stand. 
The S&P is not too far away from a fresh record closing high. Here in Europe, uh, we're a little further away, but we're certainly moving in that direction. The stock 600 uh, is up by four points today, nearly five points today up 1%. Uh, and as you can see, tracking 483 right now. We got through the 490s on the stock 600 not that long ago. So we've got a little way to go. But nevertheless, the momentum towards the back end of the week, pretty good. The pound is bid today. We're certainly repricing the Bank of England, an expectation maybe that Omicron won't be as severe. And as a result of which, we're looking positive there. And gas prices have come down massively on both sides of the Atlantic. Up next, we're going to talk to Bill Al Hafiz, Macro Hive CEO and founder. He's got his grey swans for 2022. We'll talk about those next. This is Bloomberg.